<clears throat> All right, now I've got a recording started. Um, it's still 148 seconds. Um, uh, let's see. What do I do during this time? Normally I just say things and, well, okay, I can tell you about what happened in my morning classes, right? I had two sections of calculus this morning. I didn't have any true technical mishaps or difficulties. What I had was at the beginning of the first section, um, people were like, we can't hear you. And so I thought maybe my microphone was not turned on. It was turned on. I just wasn't speaking loud enough. I, I remember now that this microphone requires me to really speak up in order for you to hear me. So I'm almost, I'm not, I don't wanna say I'm shouting here in this room by myself, but like I need to talk louder and I'm trying to do that. Um, so I got that fixed, you know, second section was like, okay, just keep talking kind of more loudly and I'm trying to do this right now. Um, and then in the second section, sort of like, 15, 20 minutes into class, uh, my foot fell asleep because I was sitting crisscross applesauce in my chair. And so, you know, just, I had that, that was quite a moment. Like, I I hope the students were laughing at me. I have no idea. Uh, makes me think that maybe I should like, so I was, I was just, you know, like, I, I had socks, but like right now I'm wearing shoes in addition so that like maybe this will prevent me from trying to, sit in a manner where my leg is going to fall asleep again so um my, where my foot falls asleep so yeah it's almost like maybe i need to like get soccer cleats is that a thing it cleats cleats are for soccer right like <laughs> this tells you what i but maybe yeah if you wear cleats then you will not sit in a position that makes you have your leg fall asleep <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, that's how my morning was going. Again, no actual tech. Oh, geez. No actual, I just threw my pen. No actual technical difficulties, just kind of random moments like that. All right. I hope, even if I don't actually see your reactions, I hope that was at least somewhat kind of amusing. And hey, it's part of the recording. Anyway. All right, I gotta move this timer thingy over to the other monitor. Um, and then, let's see. So, <clears throat> um, it was pointed out to me kindly that uh, I missed a thing in announcements. So, um, by Wednesday, by tomorrow, it's just a, a little, a short, it's meant to be like, just if you do it, you can get full credit. Um, just like uh, this pre-exam inventory, just kind of like, it, it asks you a couple questions just to go like, hey, what kind of questions do you anticipate will be on the exam? So just, if I can try to do, I'm gonna try to do do all the announcements in order. So today's Tuesday, um, there's a pretend quiz. I would suggest you do the pretend quiz online before doing the actual quiz do the actual quiz um, it's technically you know meant to be done today but in case there's any technical difficulties so by tomorrow but like let's just say by tuesday i'll say tuesday that way you know do it and then but it's i i think in, in what i set it up in canvas is it's due on wednesday um so then um on wednesday uh, this this thing that was just mentioned up here this this pre-exam two assignment it's not going to take you a long time but please do that. Um, I posted the instructions yesterday. It is the same set of instructions as the pre-exam one assignment. Um, so please do that. Uh, and then as is typically due on a Wednesday is a response. Um, that response number is seven. So please do that. And then Thursday, Thursday is uh, when there's a uh, homework number seven. So please look at that. If you're stuck, um, certainly, um, you know, visit office hours or, you know, work with each other. Um, and then um, Thursday, uh, since we have an exam, it's a take-home exam. Uh, I had mentioned yesterday that just, I think the plan is just to have class time, like this 11 o'clock hour on Thursday, just as like sort of an extra office hour. So um, if there are no objections, I hope that works out. Um, and just because I need to, you know, it's like easy for people to miss certain announcements that they haven't had a chance to join. Please note that the 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 uh, text we're working through, right? The text is available online. So the text is in Canvas. Um, 
please take a look at that. Um, these cl the class notes that I'm basing things off of. So on another screen, I'm looking at my PDF. So the PDFs, if, in case the videos are uh, difficult or just too time consuming for you, um, you can join live, you can watch the recorded videos after, or you can just look at the PDFs. The, and so those PDFs, um, my lesson plans in essence are in Canvas as well. So I'm just trying to give you as many uh, options as possible because I know, uh, you know, okay, I won't belabor this, but we know that this is not all so ideal. So just giving you options. Um, um, I see in my notes here just this, I think it's good to have the reminder that um, I, it's important. Um, I cannot stress enough that the, the 10 days where we looked at all the methods of proof, these these are the most important things. So I like the core of what we look at um, and we just keep practicing for the rest of the semester really is uh, how do you prove what proving, you know, a statement that starts for all X in U and then there's something that comes after using for all X and U. How does that look? Um, kind of older for us is things like uh, proving there exists. I mean, this showed up because uh, exam one had um, uh, proving and using evens and odds. And so there's there were exists already in there. But I guess I'll just remind you, like, these four things uh, just kind of keep showing up throughout the semester. And then sort of newer-ish for us is if you're given a set U, so maybe inside a problem, I define for you a set U somehow. So in the squiggles, it's either the comma separated format or it's the uh, a set builder with criterion format or it's the running through another set format. Um, based on how a set U might be defined, now it's also important to pay attention to how, how, you, how is it that you go about proving that maybe uh, Y belongs to capital U, or how is it that you go about using Y belongs to capital U? These are the, the big ideas that we keep practicing over and over and over. I wanna um, emphasize some of the key kind of mistakes that tend to show up uh, from yesterday. So as far as how definitions work, the one of the things I want you to, to keep practicing is when you read definitions, think about the grammar. So. Um, it's really common for people to want to say something like an ordered pair is reflexive, but this ordered pair is not reflexive. An ordered pair can never be reflexive. So reflexive is about does, I mean, I'm being a little informal here, but reflexive is something like, does this ordered pair belong in the relation you're talking about, along with all the other ordered pairs that need to belong? If so, then the, the relation is reflexive. Don't ever refer to an ordered pair as being reflexive. And the other key point I wanted to emphasize yesterday, I don't normally anticipate a lot of questions coming from it, but it might be our format, is that a definition, um, all of our definitions uh, talk about, a definition is about what is, I know this sounds so strange, um, not about what what is not, right? So not, not about what is not. So sort of, I have in my own notes to talk about this analogy. Um, so I, yeah, in my PDF, I see something about US citizenship. Um, so it's it's a decent example to work off of, the, the idea that, um, you know, by definition in US citizenship law, someone's a US citizen if they're born on US soil or naturalized after immigrating as, as a citizen, right? So like it, the other criteria don't, don't matter, right? It's, it's, it's the, the definition of, for instance, US citizenship doesn't refer to other things like how somebody votes or, or where somebody lives or anything like that, right? So somebody born on US soil moves to Canada when they're a half year old, they're still US citizenship until they give that up, right? So um, let's see. So let me, oh, these are things we've said in the notes. I'm gonna scroll through a little bit here. And I need to make the following point. This is in my PDF at the top of page three. Um, so I just wanna remind you that given the set A, a binary relation, Move the microphone. A binary relation on A. It's the, the 
I'm skipping that 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 first definition. It, but a, a binary relation on A is a binary relation from A to A. And the the reason I know we wrote this yesterday. I know we even wrote this on the Thursday before break. But the reason I want to focus on this definition right now is I want to ask you all the question: Do you see? Any mention of reflexive, symmetric, or transitive in this definition right here. And I hope you're saying, well, no, I don't see that, right? So this up here, there's no mention, right? There's no mention of, uh, of, of reflexive or uh, symmetric or transitive. None of these words appear in this definition. This definition of what a binary relation on a set is comes first, and then only once you have that, then certain binary relations on a set are special in that they are reflexive or symmetric or transitive. So it's I think what sometimes happens is people, um, I've seen it happen anyway, like in a homework or in a quiz, I've seen people say like, I I I, sh I describe a binary relation, and then people are already assume that the binary relation is transitive. But that that's it's the other way around. So you got to have a binary relation first, and then some binary relations are transitive, some binary relations are not transitive. So um, I don't have it in my notes to explain it this way, but I'll I'll just sort of maybe draw the sort of Venn diagram version of it is. Here, you've got all the binary relations. But let's just, you know what, I'll do this on the top of the next page. Here, you've got sets, right? So like, let's say in this big Venn diagram, like inside the oval, you've got all the sets. Um, and then some sets are binary relations and some are not. So let's say you have here like the binary relations. So every time you have a binary relation on, let's just fix the set A, then you draw this in here. and. Sometimes people assume that this is equal to having an equivalence relation. It's instead, some binary relations are symmetric. Sorry, let's, let's go in order. Some binary relations are reflexive, so you might draw those inside that, that oval. Some binary relations are symmetric, the symmetric binary relations. Oh, geez, what happened here? Okay, some binary relations are transitive. So let me do that, transitive, okay? Um, and you can actually have examples of a binary relation that's symmetric but not transitive, transitive but not symmetric, like any combination is possible. So all of these regions, let me just sort of draw a kind of quick dot in each of these regions. Any of those things can happen in a binary relation, just depends on which binary relation you're talking about. This thing in the middle, when all three of these things happen, um, that was what we ended class on yesterday, that's, uh, that's a... That's a uh, an equivalence relation, right? So, in this this highlighted spot here, you have equivalence relations. So just to just to double check and review our definitions, we'll just write. And this is kind of super informal. It's not like these. I'm not doing a perfect job right now. Um, so let's just maybe R is a relation on a set A. So starting with that as a setup, then R is reflexive. Is it it translates into for all. A in capital A, the ordered pair AA belongs to the relation. Um, R is symmetric. It turns into for all A in capital A, for all B in capital A. If uh, the ordered pair AB belongs to your relation, then the ordered pair BA belongs to your relation. And then finally, R is transitive. This translates into this, the text of for all A and A, for all B and A, and for all C and A. Um, the if part here has two things that are ended together. So you've got ordered pair A, B, and R, and ordered pair B, C, and R. Then ordered pair A, C belongs to R. Okay, and then if all three of these things, if these all happen, that's when you have R is an equivalence relation. So in a nutshell, that, that's a rather brief summary of what we did yesterday. So I hope, hope we're okay there.
Um, so, for example, yesterday I uh, had pointed out that divisibility, this is one of our last divs, divis, divis, uh, on z, on the set of integers, is, uh, let's see, it's reflexive and transitive, but not symmetric. In other words, um, considering the, the divisibility binary relation back here in the this Venn diagram, let's see, reflexive, transitive, not symmetric, it lives in this space over here. Maybe I should highlight this in another color, right? Somewhere in this red region, that's where that 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 binary relation is. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do is let's. Um, it's a good excuse to practice our proofs, really, is, is what I'd like to do, is um, I'd, like to, uh, exam I'd like to first define for you this binary relation. So um, the binary relation here will have ordered pairs uh, st, which are elements of integers, Cartesian product integers, satisfying s equals t or s equals negative t. Okay, there, I've defined a relation. Oh, I should say what set it's on. It's on the set of integers, kind of given away from the Z Cartesian Z. But let me write down my words here. Is an equivalence relation on the set of all integers. So I'd like to take a moment to, just to start, proving parts of this and um, I'll leave part of the work to you but the point is um, maybe I'll, I'll circle this little boxes in in blue we need to prove all three things right R is reflexive R is symmetric R is transitive and all of our definitions or the most of our definitions from here on out in the semester you're gonna see this pattern over and over and over if you need to prove R is reflexive well translate it using the definition into like this language using symbols and so proving R is reflexive is proving a for all. If you instead had to use that R is reflexive, which is not what we need to do here, but just, just to talk about it. If we needed to use that R is reflexive, then you need to use a for all statement. So this is where, if I started to do this scroll back, it goes back to these, con these core ideas over and over of, you gotta always be clear about how it is you prove a for all, how it is you use a for all. This kind of thing will just keep, keep happening. Um, Remember that first if that you read inside a definition, it's functionally operating like an if and only if. Okay, so we've got to prove um, R is reflexive, that's proving a for all, proving R is symmetric, that's a double for all, proving R is transitive is a triple for all. Um, always always have good habits as far as how, how one ought to prove these things. So let's take a look at what's boxed in blue, right, in symbols. If we need to prove, we'll start our proof. So to prove, not that you have to write these words, but I think it helps to clarify what's going on. To prove that R is reflexive, um, since way back up here, we've got this for all, I just circled in green. Um, if we gotta prove that, we'll just let, um, and you can pick a letter. Uh, it, it could be little a, but I'm gonna follow my notes. I've got a little c there, so I'll just, you can use any any letter at this point. There's other than a capital R. I could I'm using a lowercase C. I could use a capital C. So let uh, little C belong to capital A, and then um, now we need to prove uh, we need to prove that the ordered pair C C belongs to this capital R that was defined. Well, first of all, the ordered pair First, let's just note that the ordered pair C comma C belongs to integers, Cartesian integers, just based on how the Cartesian product is defined, because the Cartesian product has all possible ordered pairs, where the first coordinate comes from Z and the second coordinate comes from this second Z. All right. Then, um, 
Okay, so that's one of the two things we need for an ordered pair to belong to capital R, but then there's this other condition. Let me highlight this in green as well over here. We need that to happen. So the, the thing is, uh, note that, and this, I know this sounds a little silly, but note C is equal to C, right? Nobody would complain about that being true. C is equal to C, an integer is always equal to itself. So if that's true, then we, we actually know C equals C or C equals negative C. I know this part looks a little strange, but I'm just, uh, maybe we should go back and, and I should remind you of a thing we did a, a long, long time ago now that if you know P is true, then you can conclude P or Q is true. When it comes to proving an or being true, you only need one part or the other. So the P is like this C equals C. So then we can conclude P or Q. So we conclude C equals C or whatever the hell we want here, actually. We doing all right? I'll just maybe pause, make sure we're okay so far. I haven't heard any complaints. So I'm going to go with that we're we're kind of okay up to up to there then. So so look that the the um why won't that box erase? There, okay. So we've got um the two parts we need. So uh we needed this thingy. We've got it right there. Right? The order pair CC belongs to Z Cartesian Z. We also needed the two coordinates which as placeholder variables were called S and T. We needed text that looks like this kind of the thick underlying green right there. And we've got this right over there. So, so we proved what we need to for this ordered pair to belong. So ordered pair CC belongs to this relation. So R is reflexive. Um, I'd like to prove uh, that R is symmetric and then I'd like to leave it to you to work on R as transitive. So to prove R is symmetric. I'm just starting a new paragraph really here. It's, you know, when you prove that you've got an equivalence relation, you could think of it as just three separate paragraphs. So um, if you take a look back up, let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, the, the definition of symmetric, the dictionary definition starts with two for alls. So we need to pick two things arbitrary from the set. Uh, it says capital A up here, but we know for us it's, it's uh, the set of integers. So you can use any two letters you want. I would maybe avoid little c. There's plenty of other letters. I'm going to use as my notes have here, little j and a little k. Normally belongs to capital A, but that's the, in the generic definition. Our capital A is the set of integers. Now, if you take a look at the definition of symmetric, it's an implication. So, you know, as you want to do most of the time, think about how you prove an if p then q. You got to assume p. So we'll assume. So we'll assume or suppose the ordered pair JK belongs to R, and then we want to show WTS that the ordered pair KJ belongs to the, the relation. So since the ordered pair JK belongs to R, not that you have to write this since, but I'm just trying to help clarify right now where my reasoning is. So we have this thing, this ordered pair belonging to the relation and based on how the relation is written in its set notation, you should get that the ordered pair JK belongs to Z Cartesian Z. And we also, uh, and we know the following fact, we know that J equals K or J equals negative K. It's literally taking the text that was after the colon and replacing the S's and T's with the J and K. Because those the S and T were placeholder variables that are getting replaced with the specific J and K that we have right now. Okay, this part right here, this, uh, this tells us, well, since Z Cartesian Z has all possible ordered pairs, this tells us that J belongs to Z, we also know K, and K belongs to, to Z as well. So in fact, we're going to actually get the ordered pair KJ belongs to Z Cartesian Z. That's not really the part to focus on. The more important thing is we've got this, uh, let me underline it in blue over here. We've got this fact. We've got to deal with this fact and have it hopefully be useful to us in one way or another. But here's the thing. This, this what's underlined in blue is an or. And we don't use ORs a whole lot, 
But in order to use an or statement, since one of the, we don't know which of those two things is true. Uh, one of those is true or the other is true or perhaps both of them are true, but we don't know. So we, we don't know which of these two things is true. So we will proceed in cases. So since J equals K or J equals negative K, we don't know which one is true. We're going to just proceed in cases. We proceed in cases. So case one, you know, one option is we'll go with J equals K. And if this happens, then I know this looks a little silly, but then we can just write K equals J. So if you know K equals J, you also know K equals J or K equals negative J. That was the, I'm just trying to like really get things in, in the same literal order. I know it's kind of super picky. It's just because the problem doesn't have as many moving parts. So I'm trying to make some moving parts. So, so combining, in this case, the KJ ordered pairs in Z Cartesian Z together with this fact that we just got. Here we can conclude that the ordered pair KJ belongs to the relation R. In case two, so the other thing, yeah, so it was either this thing or that thing. So if J is equal to negative K, um, then we'll have, uh, just swapping the two sides of the equation, we'll have negative K is equal to J. Uh, so just by multiplying by negative one on both sides, we'll have k is equal to negative j. And if we have this, again, if you know a fact, then you also always know the fact where you stick on anything else you want in, in an or. So you so we know k equals j or k equals negative j. And so we've we've again reached um, the 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 part that's after the colon that we need, and we're gonna get here the order pair kj belongs to R. So in both cases, we reach, we reach the conclusion we need. So in both cases, doesn't matter which way you dice it, you're going to ev eventually get to the ordered pair KJ belongs to R. And this concludes really what we needed, right? So we assumed ordered pair JK belongs to R, and then we finally concluded uh, over here. We finally got what we need right down here that in, in each case, we have the ordered pair KJ belongs to R, so R is symmetric. This is probably a good place to pause, see if we've got any questions from the crowd. Dr. Kim? Yeah. I really have no idea what you just did with that proof by cases, but I don't really have a specific question for you. Is okay. there just a different way you can explain? I don't, I just don't understand your process. So the, yeah, okay. So the, the thing is, um, what's in, do you see this text here that's in blue? We, we know that J equals K or J equals negative K. And that, that was just taken direct, essentially directly from the, the way the set was defined. We just had to replace the S and T in the set definition with the J K that we have. And it's the, the, the point here is how do we manage knowing this this disjunction? We deal so often with managing a conjunction. You know, when you have an and statement, that just automatically splits until you get both of the two separate facts, and they're both true in an and. But with an or, an or, only one of these two things is true. And we eventually need to reach this goal here. We need the ordered pair KJ to belong to the relation. And in both cases, we can reach that. And so if you start with the fact that k is equal to j, you can get to, let me under, let me, let me use a new color here. So let me underline in red. We, we, let me scroll up a, a little bit as well. Um, this in the, in the definition where it says s equals t or s equals negative t, if we want the ordered pair kj to belong, Notice you've got to replace the S's with K's and the T's with J's. So let me kind of write that sort of up here. We need, I'll replace all the S's, right? Because the S is the first spot and there's a K in the first coordinate. So we're going to replace all the S's with K's. The second spot is a T. Second spot over here is a J. So we need K equals J or K equals negative J. Am I good with... 
I'm not saying we've done it, and I, I have more of an explanation, but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we're trying to go from knowing this fact, knowing that j equals k or j equals negative k, and we're, our goal is to get to k equals j or k equals negative j. And on yeah, some I, level, yeah? Yeah, I think I'm understanding now. I think I just had a disjunction there. <laughs> okay, D no pun intended? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it, it, the point is somehow to take this text that's in this red box, J, we know j equals k or, or j equals negative k, and we want to prove this other fact here that k equals j or k equals negative j. And look, on some level, if you just stare at it, this should be true. But what I'm just trying to do is instead of like sort of staring at it and saying, oh, this should be obvious, or each of the or parts corresponds to the other or part, like instead of doing that, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to do the best possible to not reinvent the wheel, to always bring it back to the way that we've looked at proving and using specific types of things and the ors, we don't get to see that often. So I'm just trying to point out that because we know this or fact, knowing an or typically leads to then saying, okay, you've got to break into proof by cases. And in each case, you do end up proving this, this fact up here that, that k equals j or k equals negative j. I think it will be actually rather instructive for you all to try at, on your own. Um, so we, we won't do it here, but I, you know, sometime later, please try proving that r is transitive. But if that proof is done, it will be, um, you know, a little longer than the symmetric proof, but not not a whole lot. Then then we would draw a box and be done with this. Right? Um, I'll just point out, and you can think about. Well, it's it's written in the notes, but I'll just write one of these um, that if you defined R to be the set of ordered pairs x y in reals, Cartesian reals, you're seeing totally now the reason why you got to be real careful when you write the reals as a set versus just a plain old R. Um, the difference between your two real numbers is an integer. That doesn't always happen. You can subtract pi and e, and when you subtract those two, there's still going to be stuff after the decimal point. But this r defined here is an equivalence relation. on the set of integers. And there's other examples. You can certainly take a look at notes. I do want to write down one more example because we're going to actually play with this example uh, right now. So I, I've got a set R, uh, ordered pairs U, W um, in integers, Cartesian integers, um, satisfying the property that five divides u minus w. Okay, this is an equivalence relation. On, oh, I'm sorry, uh, my earlier example, I shouldn't have a z here. I, I'm going to fix this. This should have been a reals up there. So, sorry, the correction I just made, I'll draw a red arrow to that. Oh, my goodness. I've had a little bit of coffee and this whole, like, foot falling asleep thing in, in, in my second section of calculus didn't, didn't help me out here. All right. Okay, so we've got, um, right now, what I don't want to focus on is trying to prove that we have an equivalence relation. That's something you can do. In fact, I would encourage you to do it. What I want you to do, and I mean, if you look in the notes, you can cheat right now, but I want you to try not to look there. Uh, for a moment, I want you to try the following task. I'd like you to find three elements in R, so in this set R, um, that have eight as a first coordinate. So what I'm asking you to do is um, guess and check if you want, but uh, you know, the kinds of things that belong to R here are always ordered pairs. So by eight as a first chord, I mean an eight there. Now you fill in the spot where I just drew a question mark so that if you filled in this spot correctly, there's many options, then this thing that you have does in fact, check mark, actually belong to R. And feel free to guess and check a little bit. I 
I should almost like make you all just type it into the chat area or something like this. Take a look at just, I'm not going to start saying answers right away, but I just want you to notice that the eight, you know, I'll use blue, this eight here, first coordinate, that takes over for you. My question, I guess, becomes you need to, let me use a new color, green right there, where the question mark is, what you fill in for question marks is going to take over for W. So what's, you need to find a W such that 5 divides 8 minus W, right? That's, that's your goal. All right, can I ask for <laughs> people to, to bravely unmute a mic and throw out a possibility for the second coordinate that'll work? Three. Three? Okay, so we've got eight, three. Sure, so five divides, eight minus three. Yeah, five divides five. Sure, yep, cool, that works. Other ordered pairs, eight comma? Two. Two? So if you put a two in there... Um, negative two, sorry. Oh, negative two, okay, yeah. So otherwise you'd have had five divides six. But now you've got here five divides ten is the statement, right? I just, sorry, I should, I'm skipping a step. Just to make sure, I, if you see it, you already see it, but just, I should explain better. Um, this is, we're asking five divides eight minus negative two. So that becomes five divides 10. And yeah, sure, that's true. And then eight one more, just one more here. One more possible second coordinate. Any takers? Negative seven. Negative seven. Okay, so what this ends up being, so the reason this is true, right, this is an if and only if, in a sense, to um, to, to five divides um, eight minus negative seven. Yeah, so the, the, the idea that, that five divides 15, right? So there's lots of other options. Um, if you stick to, to positive, Second coordinates, um, basically every time you start with a number that works, so like the, the three, uh, you add five to it, you can get another number that works for second coordinate. So I think you, you can see that if the first coordinate is eight and you stick to positive numbers in the second spot, then the units digit is always gonna end in, the units digit is gonna either be a three or an eight. I hope this is working for everybody as far as getting examples of ordered pairs that belong to R. We good with that? Okay, I'm gonna go with we're good with that then. Um, the thing is, we're going to look at a definition in a moment. And the definition, I'm, I'm trying something new. It's not in my notes quite this way. But I'm trying something new in that I want to preview what the heck the next definition is going to give us by just saying, let's take a look at these second coordinates. Let me circle them in red. This 3, negative 2, negative 7, 8, 13, 18, 23. It is actually very useful in math classes after 225 to talk about all of those numbers all at the same time. And the way to talk about a bunch of numbers is to create a set. So the next definition, just to do a little preview, this next definition we're going to look at is going to achieve giving us 3, negative 2, negative 7, 8, 13, 18, 23, and many other numbers all together in one set. The, now, uh, of course, in a set, order doesn't matter. So these, these dots are probably a little confusing because this is not in a great order over here. There's, you know, it's not quite a numerical order or whatever, but all of the numbers you could possibly get as a second coordinate, because there's, there's more in this list that we just didn't write down. We want to collect those all into a set. That's what the next definition is going to be about. So let's, let's formally write that down. Definition. 
let R be an equivalence relation. on the set A. So this first sentence, uh, we have not finished defining anything. Um, this is just the setup, okay? So the, the definition we're about to look at only applies if you have an equivalence relation on a set. If you don't even have that, don't even look at this definition. You gotta try, it, try the definition on a different binary relation instead. So you gotta first have an equivalence relation. Not only that, here's another setup sentence. Here's a second setup. Another part of the setup is you need an element of the set capital A. So this is the same A, same capital A, right? This capital A, that capital A are the same capital A. But uh, there are two things you need. You, you need an equivalence relation on a set, and then you need an element of that set. And once you have both of those things, and yeah, only once you have both of those things, there's this definition applies. The equivalence class, the equivalence class of little a, uh, that's that same little a from earlier in the let a in capital A, is, here's new notation. So square bracket a, square bracket, a little subscript capital R, and it equals uh, curly brace S in capital A, satisfying the criterion that ordered pair A comma S belongs to R. Okay, so that in a sense completes this definition, but this is a good place to include uh, an extra term that's defined. So an element um, B that belongs to bracket a r is called a representative of this thingy here okay this is a lot to take in um, first of all, this new thing that's defined, which is called an equivalence class, so the, so the first of the new things defined, called an equivalence class, we should talk about what is it. And it is a set, right? The reason it is a set is the, the first place, the first clue is to look here. Look, it's what we've defined. I mean, there's notation before, but what we've really defined after the equal sign has curly braces. So we've got a set. And then there's this other clue that what we have is a set. Right, so I think the key thing to, to, to mention here is that in this definition, you start with, you start with, just to be a little informal, you start with an equivalence relation. Start with an equivalence relation. You also start um, on, on a, I was trying to have a little less notation. You also start with an element. You start with an element of A. And then what, in the end, you, t you mix these two things together and this definition provides you a set gives you a set, okay? So the funny thing is that um, you start with a, a relation, specifically an equivalence relation, and this definition produces for you a, a, uh, a set, a set that is not a relation, right? That, that's, I think, maybe the confusing part. You start with a relation, a relation is a special kind of set, and if you apply this process of getting an equivalence class, you get a new thingy which is a set and not a relation. This thing that you get, this equivalence class, equivalence class is, is a set, but not, is not a relation. It's, it comes from a relation. So if we look to earlier, um, I asked you about, uh, let me scroll up a little bit, sorry to do this. But up here, I asked, well, starting with an equivalence relation, which is, we didn't prove we had an equivalence relation, you just had to kind of trust me that what we had up here was an equivalence relation. I asked, if the first coordinate is eight, what could you possibly write as second coordinate? And you gave me some options. And if you look at how, so I'll take those circled red options that you gave me that all work. And that's just all what this condition here is trying to talk about. See this ordered pair A, S in relation? That S, take a look at, 
if that S validly makes the ordered pair belong to the relation, then S and S alone here belongs to this, this set. So if, if I copy the notation, 8 in brackets, 8 is our little a, then what we have here is we're going to have the elements that could serve as the second coordinate of an ordered pair that belongs to capital R. I'm going to repeat that. What we are about to write down here is the set consisting of all the elements that could be the second coordinate of an ordered pair where the first coordinate is 8. And, of course, the ordered pair has to belong to R. Right? This belongs to R part is, is, is right there. Whew. Okay, so some options we saw uh, included 3, 8, 13, 18, 23, 28, so on and so forth. Um, we also saw negative 2, and if we keep going that way, subtract 5 from that, negative 7, negative 12, so on and so forth. So here now, at least, I'm writing all the numbers kind of in numerical order, so at least the pattern dots make a lot more sense. Here you have a, a relatively complete description of a specific equivalence class as an example. There's one other piece of this definition that I wanted to to to. to cover, which is uh, a representative. Well, uh, a representative, by definition, is just an element of this set that we wrote down. So to, to be clear, like, let, I'm just saying, like, look, 18 is an element, right? So 18 is a representative of this, this set, which is called an equivalence class. I'm just using the notation for the set. Uh, eight, uh, 23 is another example. So 23 is a representative of this equivalence class. Um, 8 is a representative of the equivalence class. Okay, good place to pause. I know there's a lot kind of thrown in right now. Maybe somebody has a question. Okay. I'm going to try to summarize it using a little bit more informal language. So I'm not using official official language right now, but I think sometimes using this kind of more casual language helps make more sense of what's going on. But to try to summarize what's going on with this is I'm going to just briefly use this language. A is related to S. This is not official mathematical language. If you were to tell one of my colleagues that I said this phrase to you, they might laugh at me, but I think right now it helps. So if we use this, if this means, uh, this is what we're using right now to mean the ordered pair AS belongs to R. Of course, another way to write this is, um, also we could write this as A capital R S. Then the whole point is then, just to be informal and try to summarize what the heck this thingy, this this thingy, this new equivalence class thingy, this is the set of all things related to A. So um, I think there is this theorem that I want to talk about, though it is a little involved and it's perhaps also not the most important thing so I, I think it given that we've got eight and a half minutes I here's what I'd like to do I, I I will state the theorem in a moment but I actually would like to have you take a moment to practice um, using go let me just copy paste up here um, yeah here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take this equivalence relation from earlier copy paste this down here I think it's actually really instructive to have you re-examine here, just kind of just doing this on the fly, but I'd like you to write this set. And of course, uh, let me start by saying one way to write this set is directly from the definition. So if there's a zero there between the brackets, take a look here, there's a 
there's a little a, so all the little a's should be replaced with zeros in, and I'm gonna take this text there and write this. Um, so it just should be the set of S's belonging to A, A, R, A is Z though, right? So I'm just copying the Z from right there. Satisfying ordered pair is zero S belongs to capital R. So I, that's fine, but that's just kind of directly applying the definition. It doesn't give you a really good sense of exactly what belongs to this set. So I want you to write this set in a more down to earth manner, just like we did here. So just like, maybe I'll copy paste this on, on the next page as well. So I just like, I want you to write in this style. So this, this style of writing, I'd like you to, you know, I think making you do some of these computations and think about these things, it helps build a better intuition for what the heck is really going on. And if you're done with that and you're bored, uh, so work on that. But if, if you want another one, just why not try that? So why don't I give you a moment to just, and if you do that one, oh, here's a fun one. I'm going to have you, oh, this is totes awesome. Did I just say that? Oh no, it's in a recording now. I'm just thinking of these kind of right off the, the top of my head, but like the, there's some there's some good there's some good gems here. So think about filling in this squiggly space up here, writing in a style that looks like like what's what's there. I'll stop talking for a couple minutes here, give you a chance to to work. You can, I mean, I'm willing to try creative things. Like if you wanted to check your work, you could turn on your camera and point your your paper directly in, onto your camera and then show me what you got and then we can talk about it. Okay, maybe I'll say a word or two about this this first one here. Um, what what's written here? If I underline this in red, that's technically correct. There's nothing that's wrong about it, but um, I think one of the important things to do is to sometimes like written like that. It's just too close to the definition that there's not like a really good sense of getting a chance to process what what's really in the set. You know, so that's where because the point is membership in this set here depends on membership of some ordered pair in some other set so it helps to 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 really dig into it and um, i hope you discovered um you know so writing in like a comma separated format it's not a very efficient format to be really honest but it is it's like a lot more helpful and going oh here's what really belongs in the set so i hope some of the elements you discovered that belong to the set included 0 5 10 15 20 let me write that better here, 15, 20, and so 25, so on, negative 5, negative 10, negative 15. So I, I just wrote in the format I did to try to get these in, in order so that my pattern dots made a lot more sense. Are we, is that looking all right? I have not heard a complaint yet, but I'll just, I'll wait. So, I mean, the both of these are correct. So what's underlined in red, totally correct. What's underlined right there? Also correct. It's just um, th this the one in red might be more efficient, but it, I think it sort of hides some understanding. And so I think you know part of the reason I wanted to spend a moment doing this is this is the kind of thing that I think. Of course, this doesn't it, itself lead to a proof of anything. If you but like the more you get to practice what what's really going on with a definition, 
the, the easier it is to deal with these sorts of things in proof. So as, as another example down here, um, let's see. So we want uh, to write down numbers where 5 divides 1 minus any of the numbers we write down. So 1, 6, 11, 16, 21, 26. I hope I'm doing this right. I'm just trying to do this without... Let's see, subtract 5 from 1, so negative 4, negative 9. I hope I'm doing okay here. Negative 14. And maybe one more. Now we want to write down in, in this space here, we would like to write down, um, we're writing down the W's, right? So we're trying to write down, uh, having plugged in for the U, plugging in this five that's right there, uh, we want five divides five minus a number we write down. So, well, like five, 10, 15, is this working? 20? Zero, negative five. We can keep subtracting or adding five. Do you notice anything strange? You notice some level of... Have we seen this set before? <laughs> Wait till it's awkward. <laughs> I, I hope what you, you're noticing is, so we started with an equivalence relation. We wrote down three sets. Here's a set. Here's a set. Those two sets are different. And then here's a set. But take a look, this, this last set and this set up here, these are equal. They are the same set. And so you'll discover this kind of phenomenon occurs uh, quite a lot. And that's that's what the, the next theorem, which we'll look at, and even, to be honest, if we don't prove the entire theorem tomorrow, I'm not too concerned. But I do want to write this down right now because you're, you're sort of discovering, at least by example, part of how this theorem seems to be operating, why it seems to be true. If you let R be an equivalence relation, an equivalence relation, an equivalence relation, on the set capital A. And then another part of making this theorem work is you've got to pick two elements, or you've got to pick little a from capital A, you've got to pick little b from capital A. Now, little a and little b could be two different things from capital A, or could be the same thing. And then the following are equivalent. So one of the so all three of these things are either true at the same time or they're all false. And we'll end on this. So the ordered pair AB is in the relation. This is true if and only if the equivalence class for A and the equivalence class for B are literally the same set. And this is true if and only if the equivalence class for A and the equivalence class for B if you look at the intersection of those two sets, you get not the empty set. So tomorrow we'll look at um, practicing this definition of equivalence class a lot, a lot more and take a look at parts of the proof of this. Um, just before we go, uh, sorry, my screen's flashing. I got it in class. Uh, just a reminder, please do the, on, uh, the online quiz. So um, do the practice quiz first, just so that you see the format, and then go ahead and do the online quiz. Um, Ideally by the end of the day today, but if you do it by the end of the day tomorrow, I'm not too stressed about it. Okay, see you tomorrow or for office hours.